All right, this is a continuation of the uh, projectile motion notes uh, from Monday. Um, once again, in this picture, you can see uh, object dropped versus object launched horizontally forward. They have the same vertical motion, hit the ground at the same time. Only difference is the yellow one is moving forward. Um, we kind of went through this question the other day. Now it's with a bullet. Right, which bullet would hit the ground first if uh, fired horizontally versus simply being dropped. Uh, and as we went over the other day, they would hit the ground at the same time, same, same, or fall the same vertical distance, accelerate by the same gravity, times would be equal. Okay? The only difference is that fired bullet would have a very large horizontal speed, you know, hence it would hit uh, very far away. You really couldn't see that if you had a large, flat, open area. This is a little different question, though, and if you click on the hyperlink, uh, hyperlink within this PowerPoint, you'll be able to watch a good six to seven minute video on it. Um, but if you were to have a situation where you want to shoot at something, would you want to aim above, at, or below that target? Right, and here the target is a monkey. If that's your line of sight, right, so you can look through the barrel, you line up the monkey, you would actually want to aim high because the bullet's going to start to drop the moment it comes out of uh, the gun. If on the other hand, the monkey let go of the branch at exactly the same time, you would want to watch this link, right? It's a pretty cool video. We'll show it in class as well. But you would want to aim directly at the monkey, okay? Because what happens is the monkey would fall the same amount of distance vertically that the bullet would fall below the line of sight, right? So if you had a high velocity projectile, it wouldn't curve that much below the line of sight, but neither would the monkey fall that far, but they would still both meet here. If the projectile launch was of a medium speed, uh, it would curl down more, but the monkey would have more time to fall. And if you had a slow speed shot, it would have a bunch of curvature here, but the monkey would have more time to fall, yet they would still meet. Okay, Watch the video for a better explanation. Uh, it's pretty cool to see. Okay. Now some of the math involved here. Right. Once again, we can break things down into horizontal and vertical. It becomes a lot easier to solve. Right. In this object, we ha or in this uh, instance, we have an object horizontally launched um, from a five-meter height, and the object travels 20 meters sideways. So that would be its range. Right. Question is, how fast would the object have to be thrown? in order for it to cover this 20 meters. Okay. So if we break the problem down, right, we can kind of go back to our thought question at the beginning of the PowerPoint. If he dropped the ball versus throw it forward horizontally, which would hit the ground first? And we know the answer to that is a tie. So to find the time in the air, we really don't care about the 20 meters. If it falls five meters directly down, we can get the time from that information, right? So then it simply becomes a free fall problem at the beginning here, right? We know the distance of fall is five meters. We know the distance um, is going to be found by doing one half of g times t squared, right? One half of 10 is five. Five divided by five is one. The square root of one is one. This would, thing would take exactly one second to hit the ground. Okay. Once we know that time, okay, we can then move to the horizontal, all right, because horizontally we know the velocity is constant. All right, so we can simply do V equals D over T. Now we would want to use the 20 meters here for this distance because it's horizontal distance. This will solve for our horizontal velocity, which we know is constant throughout the fall. So 20 meters divided by one second, this thing must have been launched at 20 meters per second. Okay. Another kind of thought question here. Um, 
a bullet shot from a high velocity uh, rifle can travel 100 feet without dropping at all? The answer to that would be false, okay? Because the moment a bullet comes out of the gun, it will start to curl below the line of sight because gravity isn't delayed, right? Gravity starts to act on the bullet immediately as it's released. So if you ever want to hit a target and you're always going to drop a little bit due to gravity, you're always going to have to aim a little bit higher than your target to compensate for gravity. Now this leads us kind of into satellites. Because if you were to take the same idea of an object launched horizontally and you fire at a certain speed, fire a little bit faster, file, or fire a little bit faster, you'll eventually get to the point where your projectile is falling around the Earth, right? The Earth is curved, it is not flat, right? It's a big sphere. So if we launch fast enough, our projectile will fall around the Earth and never into it. that speed is ridiculously large. That winds up being about eight kilometers per second, which translates into roughly 18,000 miles per hour. Right? Um, if things were to be launched in our atmosphere, air resistance would burn them up. All right? That is why uh, we launch things into orbit at high altitudes above the atmosphere so we can avoid that air drag, avoid the friction that would burn the object up. Okay. Misconception is that the space shuttle has no gravity uh, acting upon it. That's entirely false. The space shuttle just happens to have a very large horizontal velocity, so it's in a constant state of free fall around the Earth rather than into it. All right. If there was no gravity, the space shuttle would just fly off into space in a straight line. All right. It actually moves in a circle, and gravity keeps it in that circle. It tugs it towards the Earth. Okay. Astronauts only feel weightless because the shuttle itself is in free fall. Kind of be like you being in an elevator. You would never feel your weight if you were constantly in free fall, like if the, the cable snapped in the elevator. Now the last piece of this, um, a little bit of right angle geometry, right? All vectors can be broken into components. I've been referring to them as horizontal and vertical. Uh, horizontal can be referred to as the X, vertical as the Y. Uh, you can, if you just pay attention to your positive and negative, we can talk about left and right or up and down, depending upon what we're uh, looking at. Um, your right angle geometry, those that have already taken it have seen this. Those that have geometry now will see it very shortly. Um, with a right triangle, the two sides are usually denoted A and B, the two lengths, while C is the hypotenuse. If you know the angle within your triangle, the ratio of the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse is equal to the sine of this angle. I'll show you in class how to calculate that on a calculator. The cosine of this particular angle winds up being the ratio between the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. Okay? We really won't use it in here too much, but if you take the ratio of the opposite and the adjacent side, um, that is equal to what's called the tangent of theta. Sometimes people call this Sokotoa to remember it. Um, sine S opposite over hypotenuse S-O-H C-A-H T-O-A SOKATOA All right, It's kind of an acronym to help you remember those relationships. What we're going to be using it for is this hypotenuse side is going to give us our total velocity while the length A and B will give us both our horizontal and vertical velocity. So if we had an object launched at 30 degrees above the horizontal, um, 
at 300 meters per second, how could we calculate the vertical launch speed? All right, so here's our 300 meter per second launch at 30 degrees above the horizontal. All right, there's our X and Y axis. If we use the, that information from the previous slide, right, the sine of this angle is equal to the opposite, right, this is the Y component, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 300. If we plug those in to solve for the Y component, I need to plug in what the sine of 30 degrees is. And the sine of 30 degrees happens to be equal to exactly one half. So if we take one half times 300, right, we will get the Y component velocity to be 150 meters per second. Okay? We could do the same thing for the X component if we wound up using the cosine of the angle, because the cosine winds up being the adjacent side divided by the velocity. Okay?